Hi, I'm Jack Baker. In this presentation, I'm going to discuss ground motion simulations. I'll open with a discussion of methods for simulating ground motions, and then move on to work on validation of these simulations and some applications in civil engineering domains. This work is based largely on the PhD thesis of Lynn Burks. I'll present some information at the end of this presentation uh, for those interested in obtaining additional information on Lynn's work and her thesis. Okay, so the motivation for this work is that um, numerical simulation of ground motions is a, an area of rapid growth in, in the scientific community. Um, it's clear that the, there's a lot of opportunity for increased use of simulations in the engineering world. Um, and uh, so I want to provide some background for the engineers interested in learning more about ground motion simulation. And then a, a key um, need in the, uh, for, for these ground motion simulations to be further adopted in the engineering community is for them to be appropriately validated so that uh, the users of these simulations can be confident that they're providing meaningful and accurate information for, for a range of application areas. Um, and, and so the, the, the insights that these validations can provide, um, the feedback that for ground motion simulators that validation work could potentially provide in terms of uh, future improvements to these simulations are all important topics. And so I want to discuss our, our group's thinking about how those uh, objectives can be most efficiently obtained or most effectively obtained. So just for some uh, context, this is a figure adopted from uh, Douglas and Iochi. Uh, and it's just a, we want to start by highlighting that the methods for ground motion simulation are, are many, and they've um, evolved uh, significantly over uh, decades. Just to think about the, the range of uh, options that uh, simulators have available, if we go back a number of decades, we think primarily about empirical methods, and these are maybe not so much uh, simulation, but uh, ways of characterizing ground motion. So you know, all the way back to the 30s or 40s, we could think about just, you know, we had the first recordings of strong ground motions, and we could just reuse those ground motions as a representation of future ground motions. The ground motion prediction equations, or GMPEs, uh, arose in the late 1960s and are widely used today. It's a very mature method for predicting the amplitudes of ground motions, although not predicting entire time series. Um, the, in terms of simulation of time series, stochastic process-based methods are the, the uh, earliest and most mature. Um, so these are methods of just describing the parameters of a random process or a stochastic process, that, and those parameters can vary as a function of seismological conditions. Um, they don't provide deep insight into time series that might be expected under conditions that have not been well observed, but they are methods for producing uh, time series. The, the methods that are kind of under most rapid development these days and, and show the most promise in the future are physics-based methods. And so in, the, in these methods, we're trying to both replicate our observations, but, but also em employ physics in order to gain insight about the properties of earthquake or the parameters of earthquakes that uh, affect the properties of ground motion time series. Uh, the more physics we can bring into these simulations, the more potential we have for predicting ground motions under conditions that we haven't observed well yet. As long as the physics is right, we should be able to make predictions about conditions we haven't yet observed. Uh, and then finally, there's hybrid methods that, that kind of utilize concepts or, or benefits of multiple of these methods. Let me highlight a few particular um, uh, uh, subsets of these methods, um, and let's, let's pick a few of these to, to show you some additional information. So the first method we can think about is stochastic finite fault methods. Um, so an example of this is the EXSIM method um, by Gail Atkinson and her colleagues. Uh, there's a reference at the bottom there. Uh, and with this method, what we do is we assume a fault geometry. So there's a this cut in the surface of the Earth is kind of uh, schematically illustrating a fault geometry. Then we distribute point sources across that um, fault. And then for each of those point sources, we can compute a Fourier spectra uh, um, of the ground motion expected from that point source. So that's where the, the physical modeling comes in. Those Fourier spectra have theoretical underpinnings. So we have a Fourier spectra. And we can simulate um, white noise and modulate it to match that uh, target Fourier amplitude. And then if we do that for all of the point sources and um, superimpose those, we can get a um, simulation of a ground motion time series that's consistent with a finite fault rupture. So this method is, is very reliable at high frequencies. Um, it, it captures all of our kind of physical understanding of high frequency ground motion. At the low frequencies, it, it can um, have some challenges. In, in particular, um, directivity and fling, some finite fault effects uh, that are observed in the near source. Uh, are difficult to replicate using this type of method. Another method that's a, a physics-based simulation is called the kinematic source method. Um, so in this case, we again assume a fault geometry. Uh, rather than distribute point sources, we're going to stochastically simulate a slip distribution on the fault. So this is a, 
a map here of, of the amount of slip at each point on the fault. We also have to simulate the uh, time at which that slip occurs um, and direction of slip and things like that. Um, but those are all stochastically simulated. They're not yet um, produced using a direct um, uh, calculations of stress or, or some sort of a physical model. That would be a dynamic source um, uh, representation. But in this kinematic source uh, simulation method, we just stochastically simulate that fault slip distribution. And then we use um, wave propagation and stress relationships in order to predict the resulting ground motion at uh, a site of interest based on the slip at each point on that fault. So that's where the physics comes in. Um, we're going to simulate this wave propagation, and um, you know, simulating that wave propagation means that we need to um, specify the velocity structure of the Earth that the waves are propagating through. That can either be kind of a 1D layered velocity model, as kind of indicated in the cartoon here, where the the, the coloring might indicate uh, various properties of the uh, Earth, and they would just layer vary with depth only. You can use a 3D model as well, where you have horizontal variation in these properties. Um, that requires a, a bit more information, but it's uh, perfectly uh, achievable using this method. And then you can also uh, put in a um, local site response. You can you can uh, let the near surface uh, have nonlinearity or, or um, whatever types of uh, effects you'd like to model, and that can be also uh, included in line with this type of simulation method. And so then when we uh, think about the uh, wave propagation through, based on this uh, kinematic source model, um, we can get all the way to a time series. So this method is very reliable at low frequencies. Um, it's difficult to resolve at high frequencies because it requires um, first a lot of computing power, but also knowledge of the f um, slip distribution and the Earth's um, velocity structure. It requires um, very fine scale resolution if, if high frequency um, waves are to be simulated. So many of the state-of-the-art methods are simulating to frequencies as high as 1 hertz, um, with research methods pushing up to 10 hertz, um, but those are not yet in widespread um, use yet. So based, g given that those previous two methods had um, uh, strengths at um, individual uh, frequencies, the, the hybrid broadband method is a, an approach that utilizes the strengths of both of those approaches. So the idea would be that you could, um, for a given fault geometry, you could simulate a low frequency portion of the ground motion using a kinematic source model, like on the previous slide. Then you could simulate high frequency ground motion using a stochastic finite fault model, as in two slides previously. And then you could uh, taper those two um, ground motions together so that you don't end up kind of double simulating intermediate frequencies. Um, you can do that in the Fourier domain. Uh, and then take an inverse Fourier transform and get back to a broadband ground motion that has uh, energy at all frequencies of engineering interest. An example of this is the um, work by Graves and Petarka. We'll call it the GP method in some slides uh, coming forward uh, in, in the coming slides here. Okay, so those are some highlights of a few example methods for simulating ground motions that we'll take a look at later. Then the question is why do we, you know, why do we want to use simulations in earthquake engineering? How could we use them? Um, and the thing to think about is that, you know, we're in the overall earthquake engineering problem, we want to get ourselves from um, seismic sources. So this on the left is a kind of a schematic picture of the San Francisco Bay Area with, with um, plan view of faults uh, labeled there in blue. And so we know we've got faults. We, we know there's potential for earthquakes on those faults and, and um, to occur in the future. And we want to get ourselves to the right where we're evaluating the performance of structures that might be exposed to that shaking. Now, in the way that we uh, handle this today, that there's kind of two stages to this process. So the first is we have to think about the potential ground motions that could result from those seismic sources. Um, and so each type of earthquake, um, uh, each fault and location and size of earthquake is, could result in a ground motion. And so the, the way that this is done in the engineering world is to perform seismic hazard assessment, typically probabilistic seismic hazard assessment, to come up with a um, target ground motion intensity. Um, and so here that's illustrated via a response spectrum, so a spectral acceleration versus period. Um, here's a code type shape spectrum, and that's based on our, you know, that, that spectrum is going to vary by location of interest, and it's going to be um, affected by the seismic sources in the area and their resulting potential ground motion shaking. So currently we do this left-hand side of the picture using ground motion prediction equations typically. So these are empirical equations that, that predict the response spectra of a ground motion as a function of the uh, location and size of an earthquake source um, and, uh, and other properties. Then using that target response spectrum, we, we perform the right-hand side of this analysis using, for example, response history analysis. So in that um, 
pr process. We select a small number of ground motions, a few, up to a few dozen maybe, a um, uh, small number of ground motions that are consistent with this target response spectrum in the middle, and we're going to use those as inputs to dynamic structural analysis, and, and we can assess the performance of the structure. Now in California or the Western United States, a, a lot of times our practice is to develop these ground motions on the right-hand side to take those from recordings of past earthquakes. Uh, so that's, again, a mature um, technology. We have some sense of the stability of the results and the, the factors we should consider when selecting recorded ground motions for this um, process. However, the limitation is that we're, we're limited um, in terms of the numbers of ground motions or the types of ground motions we can utilize if we're going to use recorded ground motions. So again, there's a potential for simulated ground motions to play some role. Just to elaborate a little bit more on that point of the limited ground motions, um, Here's a figure of uh, available ground motion recordings from crustal earthquakes of the type we might see in California. Um, so this is a plot of ground motions from the Peer NGA ground motion database. The URL at which these ground motions are available from is down below. This is a very nice high quality database that's used often in engineering assessments. Um, and so what's plotted here is each circle is, is one recording of a ground motion. And they're all plotted according to the magnitude and the distance from the closest distance from the fault at which they were recorded. Then up top, the um, uh, on the right, some of the earthquakes from which these recordings came from are, are labeled. And the thing to, to th note is that in a lot of coastal California, um, you know, we're interested in ground motions from, say, magnitude 7 to magnitude 8 um, earthquakes. These are the large earthquakes that occur infrequently but are very important for engineering analysis. And, and you know, maybe distances from 0 to 20 kilometers from the fault. Right? These are the close-in um, recordings that are going to be high in amplitude and more likely to damage engineered structures. The smaller and more distant earthquakes are of some interest, but they're you know, perhaps not the ones that are um, of greatest concern in terms of evaluating engineered structures. So if we look up in this red box, we don't have a great number of available recordings. We have this um, significant number of recordings from the Chi Chi Taiwan earthquake, um, but from other earthquakes, not a lot. Um, and in particular, I've noted the California earthquakes over here um, with colored text, and, and we have a very limited number of, of recordings from California, so if we're interested in any um, factors unique to, say, the basin structure in the Los Angeles basin and how that might influence ground motions, we have a, a limited set of data from which to um, pull recorded ground motions. And so the question is, might uh, simulations play some role here in, in furthering our knowledge of ground motions that we might experience in the future in, in California and in other places in the world more generally? So the question, if we're going to use simulations, the the, the issue that arises is how do we uh, ensure that the simulations are um, providing real insights? Um, and that gets to the question of validation. So just because we perform a numerical simulation of a ground motion doesn't mean that all of our assumptions are correct or that they're appropriate in the sense of producing ground motions with properties similar to those we might expect in a real future earthquake. And so, um, you know, but, we're, but we're stuck in a bit of a problem in that because we're performing these simulations precisely because we don't have observations and under these large magnitude close distance conditions that we were uh, interested in. And so how do we validate those simulations if we don't have observations to compare to? And so there's no you know, silver bullet here, but there's a number of ways in which we can think about sim uh, validating simulations. And so let's talk about three approaches here. So the first is a, what we'll call the historical approach. And the idea here is we take a, a past earthquake. So there is an earthquake that actually occurred, for example, the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake in uh, Northern California. And uh, so over here on the left, we have a um, map of um, northern, the region in Northern California of interest. Um, the, the gray shaded box is uh, the surface projection of the Loma Prieta earthquake. The star is the epicenter. And these black triangles are nearby stations where ground motions were recorded from that earthquake. Then what we can do is we can take one of these simulation approaches and we can simulate a Loma Prieta earthquake. We can use that fault um, rupture geometry. We can potentially use a, a slip distribution as inverted from our observations, or we could simulate a new slip distribution and just maintain the geometry. And then we could put you know, recording stations in our computer model and record the ground motions that occurred at those same black triangle locations. And so um, this is the most traditional approach of validating simulations. What, what one does is takes a recording of a ground motion. So say this is a schematic figure of an accelerogram. We take a recording of a ground motion from a particular station, we take a simulation of the ground motion from that same station, and we compare the time series. Uh, we can also do things like compare the response spectra of the ground motions, which is shown down uh, at the bottom of the figure. 
And so that is um, informative, but it's not really the, the wiggles in the time series that are um, de determinative of the uh, impact that these recordings may have on structures. It's, it's the, the features that our eyes sense may not be the uh, you know, necessary or sufficient to be correct uh, in, in terms of the impact that these ground motions have on a structure. The other limitation here is that we can only do this for earthquakes that we've observed and have recorded significant numbers of ground motions from, and so that limits us Again, thinking back to those California earthquakes and their magnitudes, it limits us in terms of the, the magnitude range that we can um, validate simulations for, for example. Okay, so another uh, tool that we can use in validating these simulations is what we'll call the empirical model approach. So we have these ground motion prediction equations that, that predict the properties of ground motions uh, associated with earthquakes of a given size and distance, um, and we can utilize those in comparison. So. We could um, simulate a ground motions from some generic earthquake scenario. So over on the left, I have a, we have a picture of a, a plan view of a strike slip, vertical strike slip fault with these triangles indicating recording stations very close into the fault, just a few kilometers away. Uh, I think even one kilometer away in this case. Um, we could, and then we can use a ground motion prediction equation to say, well, at a magnitude seven strike slip fault at one kilometer away from the fault, what might the response spectra look like? And so this uh, figure in the middle here shows in the dashed black line the predicted median uh, response spectrum from the uh, ground motions at this uh, under this circumstance and then the gray line shows us the actual um, response spectra from the simulations that were obtained in this manner and so one could make a comparison and say are these you know simulated response spectra consistent with the ground motion prediction equation so this method is appealing because um, to the extent that the ground motion prediction equations ex extrapolate well from our um, you know, uh, conditions where we have a lot of observations, we can kind of extrapolate our predictions and, and compare those extrapolations versus a um, simulations. In, in situations where things, the, the ground motion prediction equation and the simulations deviate, it'll, it'll take a little more work to sort out where the source of the discrepancy is because it's a, we're comparing a prediction versus a, di a different type of prediction. But that's a, an interesting exercise nonetheless. Um, a significant extra, uh, effort went on in this type of a um, validation effort in the so-called broadband platform validation project, which was performed by the Southern California Earthquake Center, uh, and more uh, information is available um, regarding that project. In particular, a, a 2015 issue of seismological research letters, there was a special issue related to this broadband platform validation project. The methodology of these empirical validations uh, focused on response spectra um, validations there. So that's a, that's a useful tool. Then a third complementary approach for simulation validation is what we call a similar spectra approach. So the idea here is, well, if the, if the empirical model approach was utilized to figure out the, if the response spectra of these simulations were uh, appropriate, we can then take, this, um, take that validation of the spectra as kind of a given, or at least as addressed via some alternative um, method, and we can push the validations to some other um, dimensions. So here the idea is we're going to take, we'll obtain a set of simulations and obtain a set of recordings. And, and both of which have similar elastic response spectra. And so we can do that just by um, selecting samples of ground motions with similar elastic response spectra, setting aside the question of whether they would naturally have similar response spectra on average. But once we select these sets of recordings and simulations, um, then we can compare other parameters of them and say, well, if the response spectra are comparable, do the simulations produce you know, similar properties as uh, recorded ground motions? So for example, we could say, do they produce similar demands on um, structures? And so we could uh, utilize both the simulations and the ground motions as inputs to uh, structural analysis and then look at things like the drift ratios induced in the structure um, up the height of the building. So those are three methods of, of validation that are all complementary to each other and all get at different issues um, and have their own strengths and, and limitations. In terms of the um, uh, you know, methods, in, in particular, kind of thinking around the lines of the, the similar spectra approach or the empirical model approaches, um, what Lynn Burks proposed uh, working uh, here at Stanford is to use what we called proxy ground motion metrics. And we want to validate these uh, using empirical models and proxy ground motion metrics. And what we mean by a proxy metric is it's going to be a simple ground motion parameter, uh, things like um, metrics related to response spectra. And it's going to be a parameter that we can compare between simulations and recordings. Um, and, and some examples are things related to response spectra or um, both their means or their standard deviations, the correlations of response spectra across periods, 
um, variations of um, amplitudes like response spectra across uh, horizontal orientations, inelastic spectra, um, and um, time series parameters such as static flying we'll look at in a moment. And the, when we think about potential candidate proxies, the, the pr properties that we want these things to have is that we want them to be simple um, so that they're, they're easy to compute. This isn't some, some cumbersome calculation. And relatively general because we want them to be um, of engineering relevance for a wide range of structures. If we do a validation that's, that's focused very much on a particular type of structure, and then we want to use those same simulations in some other engineering application, the validation may not carry over. We may, may need to revalidate. So we'd like them to be general. Um, response spectra is a great example of that. So we know that response spectra um, have some correlation with demands on buildings um, induced by ground motions. It's very general. There's nothing structure specific about a response spectra other than to some degree the, the period at which you compute the response spectral values. Um, very simple to compute and, and clearly relevant given the widespread engineering use of response spectra in earthquake engineering. So that's, that's clear. The other um, property of a proxy metric that may, not, may be a little less intuitive, but which we think is important, is that they should be, the properties should be very stable in recorded ground motions. Uh, and what I mean is that if there's properties, let's think for the moment about a hypothetical property, we'll, we'll get to uh, specific ones in just a second. But if, there are, if there's a property of a ground motion that is comparable in a magnitude 6 earthquake or a magnitude 7 earthquake or a magnitude 8 earthquake, that's great because we have lots of observations from magnitude 6 and magnitude 7 earthquakes and we might know what the right answer is uh, in terms of that property. Then when we take simulations, we can, we can both look at simulations of magnitude 6 and magnitude 7 earthquakes and confirm that that property is, is correct in some sense. But we can also take simulations of magnitude 8 earthquakes and, and make the same evaluation using that proxy ground motion metric. So that gets us around this issue of um, how do we validate ground motions that are simulations from um, conditions we haven't observed in the real world uh, extensively. All right, and so we, that's what we mean by the kind of little variation in the model predictions across this range of conditions. The other thing is all, that any sort of um, empirical prediction of ground motion properties, uh, there's likely to be multiple predictions in the literature, and if the um, if multiple researchers um, or, or researchers using different types of data sets are coming consistently to the same predictions of that property, that's another good indication that we really have a sense of what the right answer is um, with regard to that property, and, and we can then again make uh, stronger conclusions from any validation exercises using those properties uh, when it comes to simulations. Okay, so to, to uh, look at some kind of proxy metric uh, calculations, let's look at the uh, some example data here. So let's come back to Loma Prieta. Uh, this is that same type of map with the, uh, the rupture projection in the nearby stations. If we look at um, just the stations within 20 kilometers, so those are highlighted in red now, uh, and over on the right is shown the response spectra for those um, recordings. And then um, uh, down in the lower right, we'll look at some simulations, and these are um, simulations from those three types of uh, processes that I told you I, I mentioned at the start of the presentation. So the EXM method is the uh, stochastic finite fault method. GP is the Graves and Petarca hybrid broadband method. And then CSM is the composite source method. That was that kinematic source that's, that's using just the kinematic source method and not uh, tapering in the um, uh, stochastic finite faults at high frequencies, but trying to get the physics-based um, wave propagation right through, through all frequencies. Okay, so in the lower right here is shown the response spectra from the Graves and Petarca simulations. Um, and so we see in, in terms of general amplitude, they're, they're comparable. There's a little less variation. Uh, that's in part due to some differences in treatment of um, near surface site conditions, but in part uh, due to kind of natural variation in those observations that wasn't reproduced in the simulations. We can layer in uh, simulations from the other two methods as well. So now we have a kind of busy picture down at the lower right of uh, the individual response spectra. And then in the heavy lines, you can see the uh, geometric mean response spectra, which are relatively comparable in all these cases. Okay, so as we look at the uh, properties of these ground motions, one, the one thing we're going to look at that makes a, a very good proxy metric is the ratio of the maximum spectral response across any horizontal direction versus the median spectral response of a ground motion across any horizontal orientation. And so to give you a sense of this definition, let's first look at a video quickly. So this is a, um, a video that's uh, going to illustrate how we compute this uh, proxy metric. So what we have here shown is um, in two figures, the in the, the horizontal plane here at the bottom of these figures is the displacement trace of the El Centro differential array recording from 1979 Imperial Valley earthquake. So this is a recorded ground motion. 
And then sitting uh, kind of up above it are, are elastic oscillators. So these are oscillators that are, um, are going to give us measures of response spectra if we look at how they oscillate in a particular direction. But these are going to oscillate in, in kind of arbitrary horizontal directions. The oscillator on the left has an um, elastic period of 1.5 seconds. The oscillator on the right has a period of 3 seconds. And so we'll see that the oscillator on the right is a little more flexible and, and sensitive to longer period excitation. So if we look at uh, what happens here, okay, we now have the oscillators moving. And so we can see them uh, they're shaking in, our, in, kind of in space here. And what's shown up in space is uh, the relative displacement of the oscillator compared to its base um, over time. And then we'll pivot these around so you can see them uh, in their kind of far, not, far normal far, far, parallel orientations. So some things to note is that um, you know, the direction in which, or the, the, the maximum displacement of this oscillator varies depending on the direction in which you're looking, right? So this, this one and a half second oscillator varies more in this horizontal direction, the fault parallel direction, relative to the fault normal direction. The, um, and it's the polarization of these demands that's going to be interesting to us in, in just a moment. The other thing to look at is that the, the, ma the dimension of maximum demand is different depending on the period. So the three second oscillator vary had bigger um, displacements in the fault normal direction. The one and a half second oscillator had bigger displacements in the fault parallel direction. So now let's take a look um, at this, uh, uh, these types of plots, both for on the left, um, the, the actual, um, an actual recording, and in the middle and then on the right are two algorithms for simulating ground motions. And here's a figure for a short period of 0.2 second oscillator. And then down in the bottom row is a figure for a three second oscillator. So some things, and, and in all three columns here, we have um, example time series that were kind of the typical um, uh, shape here in terms of they had the, the median value of the maximum to median response. So what the metric we're going to look at is kind of how large was the response, the maximum direction response. And then if we looked over all possible horizontal orientations, what was the median amplitude of these responses? Okay. And so some things to note is that the, the three second um, oscillators have responses that are mo more polarized than the 0.2 second oscillators. Um, that's, that's clear in all three columns. Up top, in the top row, we can see that the uh, the Loma Prieta records and the graves Patarka simulations are, are relatively less polarized in the bottom row, but the composite source model simulations are, are still highly polarized. So we can take a look at this type of uh, result in a more summarized way on the following slide. So here what we have plotted is the, um, the period of, a of the response spectra that we're looking at from 0.01 seconds up to 10 seconds, and then on the vertical axis is the, this ratio of the maximum direction uh, response spectra, which um, for those that know the literature, uh, this is kind of formally defined as a rote D100 uh, spectral acceleration. And then the, that's divided by the median direction response spectra, or the rote D50 spectral acceleration value. So right now what I have plotted are just two empirical models for these ratios. So this is um, ratios that were obtained using statistical studies of large catalogs of uh, recorded ground motions. So one by um, Shrey Shahi here at Stanford and, and myself, and then one by um, Katrin Beyer and Julian Bomber from a, a few years earlier. Um, and so those are both plotted to note that the um, one that there's, rel there's good agreement between the two models, and there's other models of this type that are also in good agreement. The other thing to note is that the, this ratio is increasing with period in general, from values of about 1.2 at short periods up to, say, 1.3 at, at longer periods. That's reflecting the, the increasing polarization of the longer period ground motion we saw on the previous slide. Okay, so now superimposed is uh, what do we see in terms of these values from those Loma Prieta recordings? So this is the, all the red triangle locations from the, the slide a few slides ago. So we, we take those 20 uh, recordings and compute the rote D100 and rote D response spectra, take those ratios and then take the, the median of them um, or the geometric mean of them across the whole record set and we get the solid black line. So it's in relatively good agreement with the uh, predictive models. There's some variation, which is to be expected given the small sample size, but the, the general amplitudes are about right, and the increase in uh, ratios with period is, is also as expected. So now, with, now that we have some sense of these empirical models and what we see in, in actual data, let's look at some simulations. So here, plotted in blue, is the Graves and Patarka um, simulations. So that's starting down at a value of about 1.15 and moving up to a value of 1.3 or a little bit more. Um, it's uh, relatively consistent with um, the, the empirical models, so a little bit of deviations. One thing to note is that if we come over at a period of about one second, there's a dramatic increase in this um, ratio or in the polarization of the ground motions. 
that one second period is right where the tapering between the um, stochastic high frequency components versus the kinematic source low frequency components comes in. And so this, this big increase is indicating kind of a change in behavior as, as that transition to um, between the two simulation methods happens. And so there's you know maybe some insights to be gained there uh, um, regarding ways in which that um, tapering could be done. Now up in red is shown the composite source method uh, method uh, simulations. And so here at, at very long frequencies or at very long periods, we see kind of reasonable consistency with the other um, ground motion sets. But over at low, low periods, we see this uh, great deviation of values of about 1.4, uh, indicating very strong polarization of the ground motions. And that's what we saw, if we go back to the previous slide, that's what we saw in this upper right corner, where this uh, short periods, these composite source model simulations are still strongly polarized in the um, direction in which they produced them demands, which is different than in uh, recordings or in the Graves Pataka simulations. So this, um, talking with a, um, yeah, there's, this is, this is explainable and that there's a um, directional kind of randomization component of the simulations that um, newer versions of that method uh, have addressed, but the, the, impl the method that's implemented on the broadband platform where these simulations came from did not address it. So that, so with kind of intuitive and reasonable modifications of the simulation algorithm, this feature could be addressed and, and made more realistic. And that's the type of uh, insight and objective we have from these simulation validation um, methods is that they're not, uh, they're not yet ready to kind of produce absolute verdicts on which simulation methods are correct and which ones are incorrect, as much as to provide insights on the properties of the simulations that are more realistic and less realistic and provide feedback for ground motion simulators to continue refining their simulation algorithms in a way that's um, provides greater insight and great, greater consistency with recorded ground motions. Okay, another uh, application of validation uh, I want to discuss here before we wrap up is um, fling step characterization. And this is a, a topic where uh, simulations again have great potential for providing insight. And the motivation here is that um, if we look at an unprocessed ground motion, so um, this is a ground motion recording, accelerations were recorded from an accelerometer, those accelerations can then be double integrated to obtain a displacement time history. And so here in gray shown is the displacement of a recorded ground motion versus time. And so we see this kind of um, displacements up to large displacements of a couple meters. And then we see this kind of steeply sloping uh, displacement time series at kind of uh, times greater than 20 seconds. And that's not real. That's, that's an artifact of kind of some noise and, and baseline offsets in the recording that when those uh, that those errors are double integrated they amplify themselves greatly and we get kind of unrealistic um, uh, recovery of the displacement time series so if we're careful with a recorded ground motion we can do baseline correction um, and that that's a method for removing this kind of drift and and noise out of the time series and we can get something that looks like this black time series where we've captured the kind of the real the real portion of the displacement time series but we've removed this kind of uh, noisy trend out of it so this is possible, but it, the, the processing is a little bit subjective. It's not uh, exactly repeated by all analysts, and it's also labor intensive, so it's not um, commonly used. What's more common is to just use a, uh, uh, yeah, let me quick note that the, the static displacement that remains at the end of the ground motion is static fling. That, that is a real phenomenon in close to ground um, faults we'll discuss in a moment. So we can recover that if we're careful, but it's a, it's a difficult and somewhat subjective process. An easier thing to do is to just use a high pass um, filter and remove all of the low frequency components of the ground motion out of um, the time series. That'll produce a displacement time series that looks like this blue time series. Um, and this is actually um, uh, the recording of this particular ground motion from the NGA ground motion database. So the NGA ground motion database that I mentioned earlier um, by default has kind of all of these static displacements removed. Um, so it's, it's using this robust and, and easier filtering process, but it doesn't preserve that static displacement. So the, the motivation here, though, is that some of the simulation algorithms can reproduce this fling step and the static fling. Um, and th because the simulations don't have any sort of physical recording required, um, you, can, you can capture that fling effect um, robustly. And so um, that's a potential role where simulations can play a, um, play a role in, in giving us insight about this phenomena of fling step. OK, so to study this here for a few slides, um, let's look at it. Here's an example time series of uh, displacement versus time. And what we're going to do is we're going to parameterize this fling step to static offset here. And so we'll think about this red line as being the, the static fling portion of this ground motion. And there's going to be three parameters 
that'll define the shape. So we, we can fit that red curve, which has this, the following equation here. It's just kind of a, a chunk of a, of a sine wave um, with a static offset at the end. And there's three parameters. There's kind of the time, T1, at which this fling starts. TP, the period of that pulse. So kind of what's the period of, um, associated with that sine function. And then DP, the displacement of this fling step pulse. So to look at kind of the properties of those things, we're going to um, look at a large set of data um, from ground motion. So there's three sources of ground motions we're going to look at. Um, one is ground motion recordings. And now these have to be specially processed to preserve that static um, fling step because kind of by default, engineering databases don't preserve it. So here's four um, earthquakes from which we could record, recover kind of raw ground motions and uh, recordings and, and process them carefully to preserve that static fling. So um, here down in the lower left is a, in, in gray was that unprocessed ground motion that we looked at before. In black is the baseline corrected ground motion with the fling step recovered. And then in red is that fitted fling step um, as described on the previous slide. So we have, in this case, a one and a half meter uh, static fling with a period of about 2.8 seconds. Um, here, Chi Chi Taiwan is another case where we have a good set of data. Um, these black triangles are uh, a map of the near fault locations where there's some potential static fling, and the arrows shown here are the, the vector amplitude and direction of the static fling um, recovered from carefully processing those ground motions. So from recorded ground motions, this study, um, we recovered uh, 67 ground motions with static fling, 57 of which had fling greater than 20 centimeters, or you know, something kind of non-trivial. Another possibility for recovering uh, fling step is to use high-rate um, GPS recordings. So they, um, some of these GPS stations now are sampling at um, rates of up to 10 hertz, say. And so they're able to, because they're um, recording kind of geodetic locations, they're able to record these static fling. Um, there's a couple earthquakes where we uh, got time series data of this type, um, and about 18 time series where we had um, static fling greater than 20 centimeters. So here's a map of um, GPS stations from the Elmayor Hokaba uh, earthquake, and here's an example of a time series um, from one of these GPS stations. So you can see clearly the um, the offset here at about uh, 40 seconds uh, in the time series, and in this one, in this case we had a nine centimeter um, static fling that was recovered out of that GPS uh, time series. Finally, we'll look at some ground motion simulations. And so here we're using um, um, Brad Agard simulations of some. 1906 San Francisco type rupture geometries, some Hayward um, rupture geometries, and then also some reverse earthquake simulations that were produced by the Peer Center uh, in recent years. And so here's a, a map of um, one of these 19, this is actually the 1906 uh, epicenter location in rupture geometry. And then in, in color code here shown in the map is the uh, amplitude of the fling in, in meters. Um, and so this is a very data rich um, set of uh, simulations because the, the simulations are on very dense. Um, also here, I guess, shown with these two black triangles are two stations on either side of the fault um, down to the south. And those the time series at those two stations are shown here on the right. Um, so we see um, kind of st static fling up on the order of a meter and a half going in um, opposite directions on the two sides of the fault, as, as would be expected from a strike slip fault like this. Um, and so we have indications that we're, we're getting kind of realistic phenomena. And, and the question then is kind of are those um, amplitudes and pulse periods and things like that uh, realistic. So um, uh, Lynn performed a number of studies to look at the statistics out of these simulations and saw in large part that they were being reproduced uh, realistically um, and, and kind of successful validation of the simulations to the extent that the empirical data provided constraints on those amplitudes. Um, then finally, a, a, a result to look at is um, we had a question, okay, well, given that we could preserve these um, static fling in the ground motions, what kind of impact does it have on structural response? And so here I'll show you a video again in just a moment. Um, and so what's plotted here are um, on the, uh, the horizontal axis uh, at the bottom is the displacement of an oscillator. And there will actually be two oscillators here. And this time these oscillators are, are nonlinear. Um, and, and their force displacement behavior is shown in this figure on the top right. So for some portion of their behavior, they're going to be linear. And then they're going to yield. And, and then proceed into a kind of a post-capping behavior where they have a negative slope or a negative stiffness here with increasing displacement that will lose the ability to resist force. Um, those oscillators are going to be subjected to two ground motions that are pl also plotted with displacement versus time on the other horizontal axis here, uh, shown in black and blue. The black line is going to be um, a recording. This is from the Christchurch GDLC station. 
Um, and then in blue is the same ground motion, but it's been um, baseline corrected. Uh, sorry, the um, the black line has been filtered, the blue line has been uh, baseline corrected, so it's two different sets of record processing on the same ground motion to look at what's the impact of preserving that static fling in terms of the, display, the response of this structure. Okay, so let's watch this structure um, be subjected to these ground motions. Okay, so we see the blue line has this larger dis displacement from this uh, preserving of the uh, static displacement. We see them both go through, and at this point, they've both oscillators have um, exceeded their kind of capacity to resist forces, and they've they've collapsed in this uh, and, and turned white. If we watch it again, what we what we're interested in is, you know, we see those oscillators are both subjected to different amounts of ground displacement because of this record processing change to the ground displacement. But if we look at the relative displacement of those oscillators, as well as the force displacement relationship, which is getting traced up on the upper right, we see that their their behavior is actually remarkably similar. So we can watch them go through again. These circles are tracing out the uh, force displacement behavior, and we see that they're they're both tracing almost identical paths um, through this force displacement behavior, and they're both collapsing at almost the same instant. So, so while we uh, um, you know, underwent this great effort to develop these uh, database of ground motions with static fling, and and simulations clearly have a, a great potential utility for for simulating these static fling effects. Um, the takeaway from this um, conclude from this study here was that actually the um, the existence of the static offset doesn't have a dramatic impact on the uh, behavior of nonlinear structures. And these are highly nonlinear structures; are simplified, but they they still um, reproduce this collapse phenomenon. And and even collapses, which is a very you know nonlinear structural phenomenon, there's not a great impact to the static offset. And the, the reason why that makes uh, sense intuitively is that the record processing that removes that static offset, this filtering, if we go back a little bit to see the differences in these ground motions, the filtering is a very low period um, cutoff. And so everything except for very low period ground motions is, um, is maintained, even though the static offset is not maintained. And so from the structure's perspective, this, the low period energy that's missing by that record processing doesn't have any great impact on the, the way that the structure behaves. So as long as the period of the structure, in, in this case, this is a structure with an elastic period of 1.3 seconds. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's behaving non-linearly, it's effectively um, more flexible than that. But if the filter frequency is, is much longer than that period, um, the filtering doesn't actually impact properties of the ground motion that the structure can see. Um, so so that was an interesting takeaway. That, and and um, yeah, I think I'll leave it at that. Okay, so to conclude this presentation, um, you know, in, in a broader context, I think it's clear that ground motion simulations are going to play an increasing role in engineering analysis, both in characterizing seismic hazards and in producing time series that we can, in, as engineers, can use in dynamic analysis of structures. Um, achieving kind of that bigger role and improving the simulations and broadening the adoption of simulations requires um, validation of these simulations, though. It's, it's not just a priori clear that simulations are superior to recordings in all roles. And so we need to validate these simulations, and it needs to be kind of informative validations with regard to the uses of those ground motions, and those validations need to be transparent. And with that as, as context, we would advocate that proxy metrics are a really useful tool for performing that validation. So things like looking at the response vector of simulations, as, as we looked at in the middle of this presentation, looking at the directional polarization of those response spectra. Those are metrics that are easy to compute. They're transparent in the sense that it's easy to understand what properties are being measured. Things like response vector are already very familiar to engineers. Um, and they're indicative of the response of more complex structures. Even though they're, they're measured using these simple elastic oscillators, they do indicate how more complex engineering systems would behave when subjected to these ground motions. So they're informative. And, and carefully chosen proxy metrics, such as these directional um, polarizations, are robust over a wide range of seismological conditions. So I, I didn't talk in detail about it today, but um, directional polarization of response spectra is very stable over a wide range of earthquake magnitudes and source to site distances. And so we have a benchmark that we can really believe is a, is a true benchmark and that deviations from those um, empirical models indicate some um, feature of the simulations that could be further refined to improve them. For those of you interested in further detail about this, uh, written detail and, and additional um, documentation and results, um, provide here in blue some um, uh, documents for those of you that want to read more. Um, so there's a paper in the bulletin of the Seismological Society by Lynn Burks and myself, published last year uh, in 2014. Lynn Burks' thesis is also available online. The, the URL here is provided down below. That provides a great deal more information about this.
And then I mentioned also the Southern California Earthquake Center um, briefly before, but, but they're playing a, a really um, leading role in this broader effort, um, both in providing the computational infrastructure to produce these types of simulations um, and in providing um, teams of people and, and frameworks for performing validation. And so I provided this bottom URL as a Southern California Earthquake Center URL related to a working group on ground motion simulation validation. And you can see uh, um, reports and, and documentation by a number of other researchers working in this area um, at that website. So um, I hope I've provided you an interesting overview of an, in, an exciting area in earthquake engineering and earthquake ground motion simulation and, and given you a few uh, takeaway thoughts regarding um, effective ways to validate ground motion simulations so that they can move into um, broader and more useful application in earthquake engineering. Thank you.